3D printed mold should make it a lot easier to make injection molds, right? I've been working with a musician, Rulon Brown, for several years. I've been making injection molds for him. He's a musician, as I mentioned, but he also develops products that are for musical instrument care, and I'll have a link to his uh, website down below. One of the things we decided to do recently, he got a 3D printer, a resin 3D printer, is to see what the difference is between resin 3D printed molds and aluminum injection molds. So that's what we're going to do here. You're going to see Rulon, you're going to see his machine. His machine is similar to my machine. The difference is that my machine has a mold height of two and a half inches. His machine has a mold height of three inches. So it's a more capable, larger machine. Uh, and that means that when I make molds for him, I can't test them because they won't fit in my machine. So in the case of these 3D printed molds, uh, he made the, uh, the mold inserts. And as you'll see, it was quite a bit of work to finish the inserts and get them into the frame made by LNS Technologies. This is the part that Rulon wants to make. He's going to make it first with the 3D printed mold, and then we're going to make the aluminum mold. It looks like a fairly simple design. One thing to keep in mind is that this is less than an inch from there to there. So these letters are actually pretty small. To give you an idea, we'll take a look at uh, the distance from here to here. And this is just 12 thousandths of an inch. So that means I'm going to need some pretty small end mills to be able to try to mill some of these shapes. And I'll, I will have some corners in here. So that, that is one place where a 3D printed mold is superior. But as you'll see shortly, there are many places where a 3D printed mold is not superior. This is the insert, at least one side of the insert, and uh, it's tapered so that it will fit into the LNS mold for 3D printed uh, mold halves. And I helped uh, Rulon with this, getting the sprue just right because he was having a few problems with that. The opening here is for the twisted wire that is for the brush, and you'll see that in the video to come. Okay, after wicked amounts of sanding, play, and goofing around, I was able to fit this in. The back is now flush. I'm not super happy with this. The, the mold actually inserts too far on both halves despite my best efforts. Uh, so we'll probably have some bad flash by the sprue. But if we can get both these faces to mate up nicely, it might work. So we have our mold. We'll see how we can inject into this. We're going to start with some low temp TPE, thermoplastic elastomer. See how that goes into this. And if we can get it to actually flow and do kind of okay without lots of flash, then maybe we'll try something else. This mold, just so you're aware, is going to be an over mold onto a brush end. There's going to be an insert here. Once we refine this, we'll uh, mill this out so we can have an insert go in. This will close off on the rod and then this will over mold onto the end of the uh, brush. So this is this is our attempt. High temp for 160 Celsius and then average everyday black uh, Elegoo resin. And we'll see how it holds up uh, if one degrades really fast compared to the other or just fails immediately. But this way we save a little money on this expensive resin and learn a lot about this process. So far what we've learned is um, printing is key and no matter what you do, it takes a ton of sanding to get these things into the blanks. And we learned that LNS Tech uh, kits should really consider putting a smaller sprue on the back side of their awesome $100 uh, mold jigs. So we'll see what happens. See if the lower temp helps. Yeah, that black stuff just wants to grip. Definitely doesn't like that. That's interesting. Got some weird deformation there. And we're still quite hot and gooey. The plastic is a little bit gooey because the 3D printed mold 
is not very good at pulling the heat out of the part. This is where aluminum has a huge advantage. The side that has the high temp is performing extremely well. The low temp is not so much. It's already torn out parts of the mold and it continues to grab parts of the, the design. Yeah, you can see the low temp mold is starting to disintegrate, stick to the high temp resin. Uh, this is just not doing well, but you look over here and this one's doing okay. The high temp stuff is working pretty well. So Draven is here with me and he noticed something very useful. Look at this. This is the, this is the low temp stuff just starting to melt and tear apart. That's where we're getting this sprue deformation. So the low temp is definitely a no-go. You're not even gonna get five shots out of this before it melts. Of course, it's coming in hottest here and then flowing in here. But uh, yeah, the low temp is a no-go. I'm actually surprised it's holding up as well as it is so far. Uh, and we're trying different pressures and temperatures and of course getting different kind of flow properties. We'll keep goofing with it, see how long we can go until this one totally fails and this one keeps going. So this is our standard black Elegoo resin. It's not high temp and we saw how that performed. And then this is the Soraya Tech High Tech Sculpt. This stuff is much more expensive, but still a lot cheaper than some other high-end high temp things. And I want to give a big shout out to the craftsman at Steady Crafting because he inspired me to uh, try to use this material and so far it's working awesome. So thank you craftsman. All right, so this was our latest shot, and we are one, two, skip a three because it didn't work at all, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve shots into this, and you can see that we've now reached total critical failure for the low temp side of the mold. It's just melty, gooey, the details of the mold are just totally obscured, lost, destroyed, and now we're getting into stuff we don't really want to mess with because it's essentially resin toxins. Uh, so I think we're going to stop there because that's pretty funky. Um, but interesting to note how well this held up. This high temp resin actually works awesome. We'll have a link for you. Uh, the detail, everything about it seems to be working well. We've learned a lot about how we would do our mold design based on this. And we know what not to do next time with low temp. Uh, and uh, it was a fun experiment to see what happened. And the crazy thing about this is these are actually, if I turn the molds this way, they're, they're remarkably flat. They were able to get extremely flat tolerances. We're having almost no flash other than the flash happening from the bad mold material and, and imperfection of the, the resin print here. Um, this side is, it's, per, it's injecting perfect. So we'll go back, um, revise a little bit, and uh, do this mold half the correct way with the high temp resin and see if we can get a part that actually functions properly. So I've been experimenting with polypropylene, low temp inject 320, 325, 340, things like this. And uh, we're getting lots of warp, but also you can see, let me see if we can see this, see right there the injection gate is starting to chip away, probably just fatigue from the heat. And this part design has not enough draft and too deep and fine a detail, so it keeps grabbing the hot material. Uh, this is the new one we did, much more shallow. This is demolding fine and holding up much better. You can see a little bit of fatigue here at the gate. Uh, it's very interesting to work with these 3D printed molds and see how they interact over time with the heat. Right now we're probably at about 70 shots, 50 shots. I uh, should have kept better track, but you get the idea. We're only about 60 shots into this, and if you look at this part, you can see this big flash. And it's where the mold is just fatiguing out, just not able to keep up, just shattering out. We've lost detail 
in the logo and it just continues to shatter out as we go. These really are limited run deals. So we're at most 70 cycles in. We have pretty radical failure of the gate and of the sidewalls of the 3D printed mold. And this is again high temp and high temp. This is the newest one retaining its itself pretty well. We've only done about 30 shots on this, but overall this has had about 70 shots. And using a low temperature TPE, it flows pretty great. It has good detail, especially if you do shallow details. You can see the imperfections of the 3D print there. Let's see if I can get that. But if you do any sort of high detail, it really wants to grab. Uh, so that's the TPE, the soft, squishy TPE that worked great as an overmold. And then here's a low temp polypropylene. Again, it really wants to sink and warp. You can see some of that warpage on that side and that side. It's pretty pronounced there. You can see how badly that warped. Uh, again, it's just you know different materials, different flow rates, different temps. These three were shot at 320. And uh, I guess it's passable. I mean, but you can see how it's starting to degrade the part because of the mold degrading. So we learned a lot about 3D printed molds here and overmolding process. The overmolding process actually worked so much better than we thought. It is, uh, you know, pretty easy to clamp these off in there. And just the pressure of the clamp, you can see that we would get that type of results on the stem. Uh, and then here's another example on the stem. I think that might have been cleaned up. But there it is. Thank you, John. One final note. Um, we did start to notice pretty radical warpage. This became a high point. It, they started out totally flat and flush together, but right where it was receiving the most heat is where it started to bloat and warp up here and here. So that now when you mate these halves, see if we can get this on camera. I'm not sure we will, but you can see, can you see through that? If we hold right up at the light, maybe. Ah, you can't really see it with the camera, sorry. But it's now got a high center right at the center of the cavity and it's kind of teetering back and forth. The aluminum mold is very similar to the 3D printed mold, except in the case of the 3D printed mold, it was an insert, whereas this is the entire mold. Uh, one difference I'm making here is I have this set up so that there's a cold trap. So this will catch in this section here any material that has partially solidified, and that will ensure only the fully molten material will flow into here. The other reason for doing this is that if Rulon wanted to, we could add another cavity down here so he could produce two parts at a time. Rulon gave me the dimension for the twisted wire that goes in here, and I made this hole slightly smaller than that, and the idea is to try to get as tight of a grip around the twisted wire as we can. And the theory is that this would either squish the twisted wire or create some impressions in the aluminum. And as you'll see soon, that actually worked quite well. Now, if we switch to the cam for this, and uh, let me switch to the other side, the one we're just looking at. So we're looking at, oops, I forgot what it was. We're looking at the cavity. So I'll go ahead and right click on this and say simulate. And I'll go ahead to the end. Okay, so this is taking a little while to calculate. Uh, and now that it's finished, what I want to do is zoom in here. And you can see this is what I was referring to with having to use a small end mill and the difference between the 3D printed molds and what you can get with CNC machining. So the blue areas here, I'll zoom in a little bit more. The blue areas here are areas that cannot be machined with the end mill that I'm using. In this particular case, I'm using a 0 0.015 or 15 thousandths of an inch diameter end mill. I could do a little bit better if I went down to 10 thousandths and possibly even better if I went smaller. But we decided to try 15 thousandths and uh, see how that worked. First up is surfacing the top using the TriFly from Shrum Solutions. Next I'm milling this uh, rough cup end to be the exact width. This is not really necessary but it makes it look nicer so I always do this step. 
For this mold, this is the uh, roughing pass, and in this particular case, roughing, as you can see, is a 1 16th inch diameter end mill. This is, for me, a large end mill. I know it's for a lot of people a really small end mill. For some reason, I never get bored watching this step of spotting the holes that I'm going to drill next. These two holes are where the alignment pins are going to be that hold the two mold halves in alignment so that you get a perfect boundary between the two halves of the mold. And I also really enjoy drilling, not really sure why. Pocketing the two alignment holes with a 3 16th inch diameter end mill. I'm using a 1 8 inch diameter ball end mill running at 30,000 RPM to cut the sprue in the runner. And it squeals quite a bit. I really need to get a shorter 1 8 inch ball end mill so I don't get so much chatter. Roughing out the slot for the brush to go into, because this is over molded, I'm uh, roughing it out first with a flat end mill and then coming back with a ball end mill to finish it up. From here on, it's using progressively smaller end mills to be able to cut more and more of the detail, starting with one 32nd inch flat, and then a ball end mill, and then going down to a 15,000th inch diameter end mill. But at these sizes, and with the spindle running at 30,000 RPM and the coolant flying all over the place, it's really hard to see what's going on. And here's the finished mold. Uh, this part right here is where the, the wire is going to go. This is going to be over molded onto a brush, uh, which you'll see in a little bit. I have the, uh, the pins that are mostly buried. As you can see, they're coming out just a little bit, and that makes it easy to put them together and take them apart with perfect alignment uh, each time. This is a close-up where you can see some of the details, and I had to use a 15 thousandths inch diameter end mill to get uh, in between the letters, which are a little hard to see. Let's see if I can give you a better view of the letters. Yeah, like right there, you can see the letters a little bit better. Uh, I'll see if I can uh, come in even closer. So here's a little bit of a closer view. And the tooling marks, by the way, are from a 1 32nd inch uh, diameter end mill. So they're not likely to show up on the plastic itself because even though you can see them here, the depth of these uh, tooling marks is very, very shallow. So My you name is your host, the Craftsman. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that's going to shut off? Well, let's try it. Yeah, I like the way it made an impression in the aluminum. Me too. Like if we could actually get grooves that it like sets into, that could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just, we'll just try it. I mean, it definitely is not shut off there. That's a good sixteenth of an inch gap. I made the slot uh, for the wires a little bit tighter for the wires with the idea that it might compress the wires, but we're seeing that it's actually creating a bit of a groove, so that's what Rulon is referring to. See what happens. And as you saw there, it was able to completely close the mold and get rid of any gaps. So even though the slot was a little bit smaller, it was able to adapt to it. So I was filming this on my iPhone because the battery of my regular camera died. Um, I forgot to bring an extra one with me. So he's putting it back in so we can restage uh, his first reaction uh, once the compressor shuts off. Okay. Wow, not bad. Not bad for a first shot and just sticking it in seems to have shut off and clamped down really tight around the, the yeah, wire. Yeah, I can see we're getting a little bit of it going around the wire, which is... But that's um, not too bad. Yeah, that's not surprising at all. And there's some flash by the wire because we're probably not clamping down as tight as we could be there. Well, I'm not sure we can fix that without having... Uh, no, I, this, this I mean the, the side Oops. flash. See, see that? Um, see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that means you can drop the pressure a little bit. 
Yeah. But wow, that is not a bad deal whatsoever. All right, let's, let's just do real light pressure. And actually, since this is cut off, I was experimenting with this again, just so I could reuse. Oh. Um, so it's not overly really tight. That's interesting. Well, because I don't have the end. I nipped. Oh, I nipped the it. end just so I could test quickly. But that sink doesn't look bad at all. It looks highly usable. Yeah, and if you have a little yeah. bit more hold time, it might reduce the sink. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, let's take another shot and see. I'm gonna put this one in deeper than we did last time just to see what happens if we get tons of grab on that metal. And we came down to 60 PSI. Uh, let's do a really long hold time and see what happens. Well, that's not good. While editing the video, I noticed that he had increased the clamping time rather than the injection time because hold time was a little ambiguous. Oh, that's that's per that's perfect. So no flash. No flash whatsoever. And how's the sink? The sink is still pretty intense right there, which surprises me because I would think the sink would be worse around here, but we have pretty intense sink happening right here along the shaft of the, the yeah, probably wire. yeah because it's farther away from the gate huh yeah yeah right because you, you were holding uh, pressure longer at the gate we could try uh, even longer hold time uh, makes a difference yeah i mean a little bit i can go 10 seconds on this machine and that's about it um but wow other than that sink at the tip the the detail and quality is Awesome. And I love how it's mating on that, that so wire. How, how's the lettering because of, you know, the 15,000 diameter? I think it's great. Okay. I think it's great. Yeah, it's the type of thing where when you see it in CAD or close up, it looks like it may be not very good, but when you see it with your eye. Yeah, and when you can hold it right six inches from so your tiny. face. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. You can barely see how the R, can you see that R? Yeah, you can see how it's rounded on the end. Well, yeah, but also it's starting to, because of this sink, starting to pull the R down out of the cavity, just oh, at the end. Can you see that? See how we've got some discoloration on how it's mating in the cavity? Oh, yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, come on, the average person isn't going to notice that. It's going to look awesome. The rest of the conversation is more conversation about the sink. And I did contact him later, and he increased the whole time for injection. And it made all the difference, and now he's really happy and doing production of these parts. Uh, thanks for checking this out, and thank you to John for his awesome, uh, you know, support in this. It's fun to get something for a hundred bucks online, trim off the top, be able to use it in our machine. LNS, if you're watching, take your standard mold, drill a small hole in the back, and now you make other molders happy. Uh, all right, that's it for here. Uh, my name is Rulon Brown, and thanks for watching. Thank you, John. I think the important takeaway here is that if you're going to do production, you really want aluminum injection molds. There are two main reasons for that. One is because they'll last a lot longer. The other one, which is perhaps less obvious, is the thermal properties of the resin versus the aluminum. The aluminum will pull the heat out of the part fairly quickly, so that means that the part will cool and you'll be able to move it, remove it from the mold fairly quickly. If you're using 3D printed molds, you have to wait a lot longer before you can remove the part from the mold. That means that your part per hour production rate is going to be a lot lower. So if you're going to be only making uh, 100 parts or something like that, then sure, you can use a 3D printed mold. But if you want to be able to make uh, many hundreds of parts, then that's where you really want to use an aluminum mold. I'm sure I didn't cover everything in this video, but uh, the idea is to give you an idea of the differences, the pros and cons, and to show you that 3D printed molds are not the magic that they might seem like if you just think about it and you don't uh, have the experience that Rulon went through. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, comment below, give me a thumbs up, 
and I'll see you next time.